Hello and welcome to the on-farm grain storage webinar two-part series. Today's first webinar will be looking at temporary storage options, preparations and key practices for success. Today's discussion we will be focusing on grain storage types, grain bunkers, silo bags, grain wings and grain pits. My name's Wendy Gill and I'm the Mixed Farming Officer based in Forbes. It's my pleasure to be your facilitator today. This is a statewide collaboration for Local Land Services Ag Advisory Team. And we're really looking forward to having this timely discussion with you. I give a warm welcome to our speakers today, Bill Burrell and Bill Gordon. Before we get started in today's webinar, please let me take you through for participants the nuts and bolts of this webinar platform and also introduce our guest panel. Today, co-facilitating with me is Neralee Brennan, the Ag Team Leader based at Dubbo. If you need any assistance during today's webinar, please contact Neralee or myself. Our numbers are at the bottom of your screen. On the right-hand side of participants' screens now, you will see your control panel. You can use the orange button to control, expand and collapse your control panel for this webinar. Today we will have handouts and these can be found in the handout section of your control panel. These resources have been supplied by the pre presenters today on your panel. There are some extremely good resource, resources there that are able, available for you to be able to be used for looking at all your different grain storage options and helping you make decisions and management of your grain during this coming harvest season. I strongly encourage you to have a look. These resources were supplied prior to the webinar as pre-resources to all participants who had registered prior to yesterday at nine o'clock. Feel free during this webinar to send in questions at any time. All participants will be muted and we will be recording this webinar presentation today. So to send in a question, you can use the text box as indicated on your control panel, or if you do have high speed internet and also a really good quality microphone, you are able to use the raise your hand function on your control panel as well to ask your question directly to the speakers in our later session. And I strongly encourage you to do so. We really look forward to an engaging question and answer session later in today's webinar. The format for today's webinar will follow be as follows. Bill Burrell will be our first presenter and then we will have Bill Gordon. We'll finish with our question and answer session and we've allowed a little bit of extra time for that question and answer session. So we hope that you can ask your questions directly that relate to your temporary storage options for you on farm coming into this harvest season. Let me introduce our guest panel of speakers. Bill Burrell is a Senior Development Agronomist with AgriScience Queensland at the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries, based in the Hermitage Research Facility at Warwick. He works with Australia's leading post-harvest grain research team, specialising in stored grain pest control. Currently, Philip, heads up the Northern Regions component of the GRDC's National Grain Storage Extension Project. He aims at maintaining a really close working relationship with grain growers, advisors and agribusiness in dealing with relevant and timely industry issues and also delivering new grain storage research. Bill Gordon. Bill is a New South Wales Grains Biosecurity Officer with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry Plant Biosecurity. He works in the Grains Farm Biosecurity Program, which is supported by the Grains Growers and Grain Producers Australia, and is also managed by Plant Health Australia. Bill is based at Orange and took on this role in 2019. He previously worked as a private consultant for more than 20 years, conducting research and delivering extension in crop protection and pesticide application. We're really happy and extremely pleased to be able to have both these gentlemen on our panel today to discuss their topics. I'll now hand over to Philip who will start 
our first presentation today in our webinar on temporary grain storage, key practices and key preparations for success. Thanks, Philip. Thank you, uh, Wendy. Look, a particular thank you to uh, Wendy Gill with Local Land Services and the team that works with her. Um, she's put a tremendous amount of work in uh, getting this uh, webinar series uh, up and running. So, as I say, particular thank you to Wendy Gill. Um, look, just a brief overview, just to uh, give you the landscape behind research and extension in Australia around uh, post-harvest grain storage. Um, I'm part of a three-man team, um, uh, that GRDC uh, 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 invest in, um, and that has been a five-year project running so far. Uh, and you can see the aim there, uh, improving grain storage results for producers and the industry, and with a particular focus on pest control and grain quality. You can see the team there, uh, Extension, Chris Warwick, who uh, coordinates and leads the team from Horsham in Victoria. He uh, delivers um, in the GRDC Southern Region, myself for Queensland, New South Wales for Northern Region, and Ben White uh, capably delivers in Western Australia. Research, as Wendy mentioned earlier, the main team in Australia is based in Brisbane uh, with post harvest grain storage research. Uh, Joe Holloway at Wagga Wagga and also Yonglin Ren leads a team from Murdoch Uni uh, over in West Australia there. Um, activities, look, just a very snapshot of the type of activities I'm involved in in this extension project, delivering on site, on farm um, and in agribusiness uh, workshops, um, aiming to get research uh, directly to the industry. Um, I'm also privileged to work with this research team based in Brisbane. And so that's a third of my time conducting field trials in association with the team. Um, and also we have a, a clear focus on providing uh, good quality up-to-date resources in various formats listed. Look, I would encourage you, if you're looking for resource information, that's storegrain.com.au website, very valuable. And for all three of us, Chris, myself and Ben, uh, you can ring that hotline, 1800 Weevil. So uh, feel welcome to ring that. And that comes straight to our mobile phones. And if we can help you with some inquiries, uh, we're happy to do so. But let's dive into the topic uh, for the day. Um, as Wendy has outlined, um, myself and Bill aim to be looking at the uh, temporary storage side of things, so bunkers, silo bags, grain rings and pit storage. I often get asked, um, you know, uh, when growers are looking to invest further in on-farm grain storage, you know, what sort of storage should I invest in? What type of storages? And really the answer is uh, in almost all cases, it's actually a planned mix of storage and depending on your the grain types, within those types of grain, how many segregations do you need to make in terms of quality segregations? The sort of storage times you're planning on. And obviously that relates very much to who are the markets, where are you selling to domestically or export trade? As mentioned, there's two webinars. The second webinar on this coming Friday at the same time is covering the silos specifically and grain sheds. But often we find that with temporary storage, uh, be it the bunker you can see in the photos here, or the grain ring or the silo bags, often we find that maybe later in our selling season as the uh, year progresses, once we've actually uh, removed and sold off some of the grain in these more temporary style storages, that we can then, the last portion can go into a, a, a more manageable system, be it cone-based or flat bottom silos for uh, uh, ease of aeration, um, ease of fumigation, ease of outload uh, in all weather conditions. Okay, this might be a scary list, but look, 
really it's just I'm just trying to a pre-harvest checklist if you like and I'm sure for the majority of you you've probably already uh, well and truly considered these if not already ticked the boxes if you like but there may be just one or two things in this list that you've considered doing um, for the future or maybe you could take the opportunity this season uh, during this harvest to undertake. Please, and I'm sure you're aware of this, it is so important you discuss with your uh, normal grain buyers, grain traders, um, what is the latest information in terms of market requirements. And that will really have a big bearing on how you're going to segregate, you know, be it on the basis of protein, screenings, whatever. But really important to keep good communications with the normal buyers and traders you deal with. The other question to ask, of course, if you intend to use grain protectants for some of your temporary storage uh, grain, it is so important, particularly in the current environment with various countries uh, making further restrictions on what residues they accept. Really important to ask the question, um, which parcels of grain uh, uh, would be wise to treat with grain protectants and which other parcels I should leave untreated. Grain testing equipment, an obvious one, you know, when was the last time your moisture meter was checked and serviced? Uh, obviously sieves, temperature probes is something I'd love to see more of on properties that really has great benefits, grain temperature probes. And of course, up-to-date grain standards classification charts. Great, this is another area I'd love to see a little bit more effort put into. Uh, running samples from trucks as we're filling the various storages, be it temporary or, or our silos. Um, you know, we, I used to do this uh, on a regular basis when I was working for a bulk handler in past years. Every storage was numbered and each storage was actually represented by a 20 litre bucket. And you might have for a, say a grain bunker, two or three 20 litre buckets that represents the quality in that uh, bunker. And that's very, I always believe if you understand uh, a lot more about the quality of what you have in each of your individual storages, it places you in a much stronger position when negotiating with grain buyers and traders and they appreciate your knowledge of the quality that you have for sale, of course. Grain storage records, a really important part of professional management of on-farm storage. As I mentioned, each storage should be numbered and that includes your silo bags. Um, record the qualities that go in there, you know, varieties, proteins, moisture contents, you know, and all that information that you regularly put on a commodity vendor deck, you know, that's important that um, you have that information recorded. Hygiene, I hardly need to remind people about this one and most growers do an excellent job on this area. But just when you are doing clean up of old grain residues, and that includes, you know, grading, sitting in one ton bags and sheds, all the places that maybe you forget about, um, insects are happy to breed in any little parcels of grain you leave behind. Um, but just remember when you actually have uh, rounded up those old residues, please just don't dump it up the paddock in a pile. Because if you leave it deep enough, you know, beyond about one or two inches deep, insects are more than happy to breed in it and they will fly quite happily at least a kilometre range and come back to your freshly harvested grain. Service and test run, look, I'm sure most of you do this, checking your V-belts on your augers, etc. cetera. Um, but look, a couple of things just to remind you, if you are using grain protectants, please just put water in your, um, and calibrate your uh, spray equipment if you're using, so you make sure you deliver that one litre per tonne of mix. Um, and just make sure the nozzles, et cetera, are working, obviously. And check the electrics on your, you know, your permanent storage silos, et cetera. Check the electrics around your aeration fans, et cetera. There's no faults um, prior to uh, wanting to operate those. Um, another obvious thing really, order any of the products you need um, uh, now rather than later, because um, you may not necessarily get hold of the ones you're looking for. Brain contamination, just be wary 
with temporary storage in particular, we really have to take note of mice, rats, stock access to, you know, uh, bunkers and um, silo bags, grain rings, etc. Uh, so yeah, just be careful. Uh, grain contamination is uh, quite a serious issue. We are talking about, I always like to prefer to think of grain not necessarily just as a commodity. I think our best attitude in the long term is treat it like it is a food product. And a past colleague, a very valued past colleague, Peter Botter, used to regularly refer to store grain on farm as food storage. And that is what it really is, food for us or food for livestock. I hope not. But just be prepared. Um, and what can you organise now if it was going to there was going to be rain interruption during harvest time? So I'm sure there's several things that you can prepare now that would help you better manage that. All right, let's jump through. Look, this if I only show one slide in any presentation, this would be the one slide. And look, to me, this is the four key points around success with storage, regular monthly checks, keeping those records, um, you know, your sieves, your traps, checking on the insects on a regular basis, identifying um, grain temperature, I believe that's gonna be increasingly important as we hold grain for longer periods. Hygiene, as mentioned before, um, you know, we really need to check all those sheltered locations inside machinery inside storages um, yeah so when those three combine that's when you have serious problems with small parcels of old residue grain aeration cooling i'm sure most of you are aware of this really has a big impact for every degree you can drop grain temperature really slows down the insect life cycle aeration useful you know in a storage for actually getting uniformity of moisture content and also holding lots of good quality aspects around grain. You know, chickpea uh, colour holds better when it's cooler, uh, doesn't go as dark as quickly. Um, germination, etc., cetera, all uh, benefit from lower temperatures. Fumigation, um, something some people tell me I go on about too much, but I, I have no, not ashamed to say that we really must stay with the gas tight sealable storages when we're doing anything to do with fumigation and we need to test storages if they are gas tight. Um, and really it is the only uh, options we have for live storage pests in our grain uh, in storage. And finally, for those specific parcels of grain where it is appropriate, grain buyers have agreed, or you know things like storing your own wheat and barley planting seed, uh, obvious uh, grain protectant use uh, location. Okay, we should now look uh, at something that covers all of our temporary storage uh, things. Probably the most important point around temporary storage is our site selection. Again, well-drained, flood-free. This is an important one, that the soil will compact and it needs to be compacted well. Uh, we need to be able to have loaded trucks operating around these temporary storages. Now in the photo below, we see um, silo bags. Personally, I think that is not an ideal situation. You can see in that photo yourself. The last thing we need, if that was not compacted soil, we do not want those silo bags over time to be sinking uh, with the weight of them in, you know, four, four to six inches deep into the soil. Um, I'm not really happy with the idea of having that stubble sitting up against, you know, mice and things enjoy a bit of protection from stubble like that. So yeah, just consider the site itself. Is it well drained? Is it a good site? Um, all weather access is always a benefit. Look, this is an important one, particularly uh, things like bunkers and uh, silo bags, but also the other grain rings and pits. Try and, if possible, if there's a ridge that's along a, lo a road line where you regularly drive past for various reasons, make it easy for yourself to inspect these temporary storages, you know, at least twice a week, I think is the minimum I would suggest for driving past and walking around, patching up holes, etc. The last thing we need to do is train the local bird life and other uh, you know, mice, etc., 
that this is the place to come to for um, a free feed. Um, and they learn quickly, I can, and I'm sure many of you experienced that. St fencing off stock, tree lines, where are the tree lines in terms of birds, vegetation, and we've mentioned those. Um, grain bunker preparation, things like the reach and height uh, of our auger, um, very important. Um, how are we going to outload from our bunker? What is the equipment we'll be using? What walls have we decided for the bunker? Is it like in the picture below here where we may have just a low earthen wall and weighted tyres as shown? Or low concrete walls which offer some further benefits like sealing the tarps, bottom and top tarps for fumigation. So there's some decisions to be made there for our bunkers. Look, this is a very helpful, if you just typed in those words into Google, you come up with a very helpful reference. I'm sure there's other helpful references out there, but for calculating the bunker size you need for a given tonnage you wish to store, plus the tarp sizes. So there's, as I say, this is just one example of a useful reference. The actual shape of the site. So really a bunker should lock to ensure that we don't get um, you know, significant grain losses from uh, rain and storm ingress, water uh, going into our uh, underneath tubs, etc. We really should, the bunker site should look like a wide roadway with a camber falling to both sides. So you've got good drainage away from the bunk from the sides and also a gentle slope if possible towards the front. So when, uh, when we have rain or storms, water is draining away from the face of the, uh, of the bunker. Particularly where you're looking to hold grain for longer periods in bunker storage and other temporary storage, I would strongly encourage you to have a proper plan before um, you actually start filling your bunker. And that would include thinking about how you're sealing the edges, a top and a bottom tarp. Um, and also here's another practical tip if you haven't played with bunkers in the past very much, how are you going to handle the tarps? Because they are large and quite heavy. And have you got labor on hand or have you spoken to a neighbor who regularly uses bunkers uh, how you can utilise some machinery to actually help you move tarps on and off during harvest and during sales. Aeration, look, something that's not that often done with bunkers, but certainly can be. Um, again, I would encourage you to consider that if you're longer term storage, or particularly if you may think you'll be at the margins in terms of moisture content, but um, for most temporary storages, we usually recommend that most temporary storages do not have aeration fitted. And therefore, we should really aim for, if possible, if the harvest is suitable, we should aim for uh, grower, uh, sorry, grain at the lower end of the moisture spectrum. So I just say, if you can aim for 1% lower than your, your delivery moisture contents for temporary storages, that is a good target to aim for. Um, yes, so uh, it is difficult once you start to consider putting higher moisture content grain in temporary storages, particularly if you have no way of lowering grain temperatures and, and cooling the grain. Okay, so but the obvious benefits, wherever you can fit aeration, you, you should try. Uh, cooler grain temperatures manages pests better and also holds quality. Power supply for fans is an obvious question, hard to get access to get fans and power there. Automatic controller, we would strongly recommend use of those when you're gonna set up for aeration. And look, realistically, if you can get close to, we typically say for silos between two and four litres per second per tonne airflow for cooling aeration, but if you can get close to that two litres, in a bunker situation, you, you're doing well. Obviously there's cost, total cost to consider in this. You can see in this setup here, we actually have a fan sucking uh, from this end and there's a matching fan at the other far end sucking air out as well. 
and you can see that a floor plan design, this is what the T piece where the fan is connected to at one end, um, and the intake is uh, built into the side walls. In fact, in the bottom photo here, you can see the two intake coming through the concrete walls with, the, as I say, the fans at either end sucking grain uh, towards um, the fans itself. Look, an extra benefit, you certainly when you have aeration on a storage, you can vent more efficiently and effectively after a fumigation. Bunker for uh, the monitoring pests and the actual fumigation process. Again, please monitor monthly at least for pests, and that usually includes probe traps and sieving grain, taking samples to sieve. Uh, as mentioned, measuring grain temperature is well worthwhile. It actually helps you interpret. When you find pests, it actually gives you an idea of how active they are. And there's plenty of good back pocket guides, as Bill will no doubt mention later, which give you the, the effect of certain temperatures in terms of their activity um, uh, and to where the grain temperature is. Preparation, very important, as I mentioned, with tarps, uh, prior to filling, and your, you can see in this photo to the left um, how that is nicely set up on those walls to seal the top and bottom tarps uh, in, uh, for suitable fumigation. And look, very quickly, a, a quick calculation. Typically, we see phosphine blankets used in um, uh, bunker fumigations. Here's one particular brand, Fumifos, in in, in the tin, as the photo shows here, that is actually not a blanket, it's a smaller version, that's a bag chain. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, but just for the illustration, if you uh, trebled that in size, um, that would be what a blanket looks like. But there's two of those in each, uh, each being 1.7 kgs in a tin, two blankets to a tin. Um, each blanket produces 561 grams, the standard dose rate for phosphine is one and a half grams per cubic meter of the storage volume. If you do the division there, that one blanket will treat 370 odd cubic meters of storage space. If you do your little uh, grain density um, multiplication, that comes out roughly around 290, 300 tonnes of wheat capacity. Um, if it give you a rough idea of how much each blanket would actually effectively uh, fumigate. Just remember, when you're using blankets in these situations, particularly the bunker, it is a 20-day fumigation. You'll see that on the label, please have a good look. And that is to do with the distribution of phosphine. Just remember, as a rough rule of thumb, phosphine gas, which is only very slightly heavier than air, it's only air's one, Phosphine gas is 1.1, so just treat it as virtually the same density as gas, sorry, as air. Um, it will move through your wheat and your barley roughly at the rate of six metres per 24 hours. So it gradually diffuses through the grain. Now that's why you need the time, and that's why we see um, recirculation fitted to large silos, etc. Just remember, look, if during the if later in the season you do end up with silo free space um, that is aerated and sealable, easy to outload, then consider when you're getting low in your grain quantities on your bunkers or your other temporary storages that moving it, you know, over a number of days, just move it all across the last bit into your silo free space. Silo bags, look, one slide on silo bags, one slide on uh, grain rings and pits to go. So silo bag, um, just you're all aware, I'm sure, that you need a separate piece of equipment for filling the silo bags and, and a separate piece for outloading. Uh, please choose carefully with that equipment. Um, look, another point, uh, one of my colleagues, we've done a number of research, that's a photo of him there actually, um, which we're going to mention in a moment, who we work with on farm to do some research on silo bags. But be particular about the quality of the silo bags you use, please. There are uh, poor quality bags out there um, that are not worth the uh, worry of having um, 
uh, open up and you've got a lot of work on your hands to tidy up if one of those bags opens up when you do not want it to, obviously. The site again, obviously we mentioned, choose carefully. Compare this site here in this left-hand photo with the site we saw earlier with all the stubble. A well compact site, plenty of room between each bag. Um, yeah, so no, no vegetation to allow mice to uh, hide in there. Um, easy to walk around and inspect those bags. Um, just be aware, at, in past years, they were claimed as being hermetically sealed. In other words, airtight, I would certainly not back that up. You know, if you had 10 silo bags, you'd be very lucky if one of the 10 were actually remained hermetically sealed with no holes in them. There's just too much wildlife out there that will create holes. Um, and so it's best to assume they're not hermetically sealed. And I know the grower that we've worked with over the years who regularly stores in silo bags for many years, he recommends that slightly lower moisture content of grain going in and regular check. He would check at least twice um, a week to uh, patch up. And look, good quality tape, uh, Celastic on the smaller holes works quite well. Just rub the, the build up of the sort of powdery stuff on the outside of the bag and then put a blob of Celastic over small holes. In general, we did do a little trial. Aeration is a no-go with uh, silo bags. The practicality is too difficult. Um, so just go with the idea of not having the ability to aerate. You can certainly vent post fumigation. So be aware that's what we're doing there. We've conducted a very successful phosphine fumigation. Um, we can use these 10 of these probes with the slots on it. It's just electric conduit, one metre long, and half a tin, 50 tablets placed in. Be careful when you're applying it. Um, be aware of, um, you know, the pro read the label carefully about application rates, etc. And then the venting is important because the bags will hold good levels of phosphine you need to vent and you're certainly welcome to talk later on that matter. Grain rings, look, getting close to the last couple of slides. Grain rings um, and grain pits. Again, site selection, very important. Just this, I guess, is one of the key questions I have. What, are, what equipment are you using to outload? Fairly easy to fill these, but you know, is an agri-vac required for the last cleanup? So a vacuum, grain vacuum uh, machine. Uh, pit construction design, very important. Do do the background reading. I think uh, you'll find that there's a nice little old DPI note around the design. Not too wide is an important factor. Obviously, the site is absolutely crucial and that you haven't, that there's no water going to drain close to those uh, pits. Aeration um, for the grain rings. Yes, it looks like it is possible. I'd be asking questions about how are you going to place a vent in the top of that tarp? I would suggest that just merely venting around the sides is not sufficient, and I would prefer to see some mechanism of venting at the peak of this tarp for a grain ring. And from the photos I've looked at and from the occasions I've walked around grain rings, I don't see them as being uh, a gas tight and suitable for fumigation. Last slide, uh, second, yeah, second last slide. Grain protectors, look, as mentioned, always talk with the grain buyers and traders before you actually apply any grain protectors to parcels of grain. Mention that, that calibrate your spray, ensuring you're getting that one litre of mix per tonne. Uniform coverage, if you're used to using tube veils or belt conveyors for grain, that generally is not sufficient mixing for most grain protectants. So if you can incorporate a auger for uh, making sure you get good coverage of your spray, very important. There's two examples, Conserve Plus and including the OP, be it Reldan or Phenocrathine, I should, that's a trade name, but Chlorpyrifos methyl. Um, just be wary if you're choosing for nitrothion, a good product, but if you're using it at the standard full rate, you have a 90 day withholding period to work with. Um, I'd highly recommend you go to the Cortiva website. There's some excellent information around their product there. KBIOL, which is the Delta Methrin based 
PBO, again, you need to add the OP. And again, I would suggest you read through the uh, material available on the website. If you can rotate chemistry, it's very important. Um, and uh, you know, maybe two years of Conserve Plus, one or two years of follow up of KBIO. Che always check your labels, please. It is critical with these products. You apply it only to the approved grain types and at the correct rates, etc. cetera. Um, and just realise there certainly is plenty of on ongoing movement in export markets on MRLs. So again, you need to talk uh, with your regular talk with your traders and buyers. And my last slide to finish with, you've already seen this, but I don't, I'm not ashamed to put this up again. Uh, please, those four points, regular monitoring and recording, hygiene, the aeration cooling where possible, and fumigate only in gas tight storages. And thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'll hand back to uh, Neroli, I believe, and Wendy, thank you. Great, thanks for that, Phil. That was a really great rundown um, of all the different options that we have. And I think with the season that we're looking at the moment, hopefully lots of people are considering uh, their storage options for this year. So. Um, we're very appreciative for that. Thanks, Phil. I just wanted to probably mention uh, the 1800 Weevil number. So just keeping in mind that you can make contact with Philip directly on that number if you're in New South Wales or Queensland. So that's a good one to keep in mind. Um, and it looks like Wendy has reconnected us with Bill. So um, I'll hand over to Bill now, who's gonna go forward with his presentation. Um, and just before I do that, can I just encourage those out there, if you have any questions, please add them into the question panel and we'll ask those at the end of the session. Thanks, Bill, over to you. Thanks, Narely, and thanks very much, Phil, um, for the information. I'm just going to follow on a little bit about the pests themselves and some things to keep an eye out for. Um, it's particularly important that we get those identifications right um, to make sure we're actually treating correctly. So there's some great resources Phil mentioned. You've got your GRDC back pocket guides. Um, our Grain Farm Biosecurity Program has a, a similar publication. And so some of the material that I'll be talking about will be found in that, and that's included in the resources and handouts. So lots of great resources there to assist people. Um, following on from some of Phil's points, just to remind people that, that, that regular monitoring um, and, and hygiene and also keeping good records are essential for managing um, stored grain pests. And obviously, Phil mentioned hygiene and, and making sure that if you do have areas of older grain and you want to get it away from your storages, those distances where some of those flying insects can travel having it more than a kilometre away. You mentioned using the probe traps, which insects can crawl into and fall in. You can use those to sample from the top of stacks. and Ideally, they'd be checked at least monthly, as well as getting samples um, if you've got um, silos from the base or other parts of the stacks and using a two mil sieve where you can shake that through and the insects will appear in the pan at the base. Um, and Phil also mentioned monitoring grain temperature as well as moisture. That temperature is critical for the development of a lot of these insects and the lower you can keep that, um, you can, in some cases, reduce breeding, but you'll certainly slow down the development and the life cycle, which means the number of pests over time will be much, much less. So Phil mentioned keeping a record, and I'd certainly encourage that. Um, it doesn't really matter how you keep that record, whether it's electronic or in a hard copy, it's having access to that information when you need to supply it um, either to a you know, a purchaser um, or to demonstrate records of treatments for your vendor declarations. So a couple of things worth keeping records of, and Phil mentioned these as well, I'm just gonna reinforce his points. Having an, an individual ID, ID um, or a number for each storage helps you um, just identify which one you're talking about. Keeping the, the details of uh, how, how much grain you have in there, the variety, the moisture content and protein, so you know what you're dealing with. Obviously the treatments that you may apply as protectant sprays before they go in or fumigations, particularly the dates and durations of those will help with um, calculating things like MRLs, um, oh sorry, withholding periods. 
um, anything that you might find in your monthly inspections, particularly the insects, um, and being able to identify those is going to be quite important from a treatment point of view, and any comments on quality. So you might notice particular odours or things in there that can give you a hint to what's going on in the silo. And the last one, if you're running aeration, just keeping a note of how long the, the fan was run for and the impacts on the temperature, that might also give you a guide as to how effective that's been. But the starting point for your records, as I mentioned at the start, is what's got to be in your commodity vendor declaration and also what the requirements on the labels for any treatments you put in there are. Um, so those two bits of information are key, but any notes you make when you're inspecting them are going to be important to keep uh, just for future management. Right, so some of the pests that we might find commonly in grains, I mentioned that publication and getting your sieve out or using your probe to, to look at it. A lot will have a, a quick um, sort of little key where you can see some of the key, uh, some of the images of some of the common beetles that might be found in there. Um, we have a couple up here. This one's a weevil and you can tell because it's got that long nose and uh, although we tend to call a lot of beetles weevils, weevils are a specific group. Um, you have your ice weevil and your grain weevils. We've got a sawtooth uh, grain beetle here, some of the lesser grain borers, um, and these, these guys and the weevils will actually get into whole wheat, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then a couple of others, like your flat grain beetles, which look like they're squashed and have longer antennae, and your rust red flower beetles. So these, these guys would be commonly be expected to be seen in storage. A couple of them will attack um, whole wheat, um, but most of them will get into broken wheat and if you've got splits and other things in there, then you have an opportunity for most of these guys to be present. So the ones that feed directly on the grain and produce, um, you know, holes in the grain, but typically it's where the, the larvae actually develop inside the wheat itself. And with these species in particular, maintain, if you're doing fumigation for live insects later, then maintaining that concentration for the required period of time of your fumigants is critical so you can get all life stages. The ones that are outside may be killed relatively quickly perhaps, but the immature stages or things that are inside the grain do require that concentration for the full period written on the label for those particular species. So remembering the weevils and the grain borers um, complete their life cycles inside and a few others that I mentioned can as well and this moth um, also does that. So as I mentioned not all weevils, uh, not all beetles are weevils, they do specifically have that modified rostrum. The other thing if you've got a magnifying glass or a hand lens you might be able to see the antennae which are distinctly bent or elbowed at the front there. Now these guys don't fly so how this is going to enter your storage will be either from contamination on equipment that comes in that's not particularly clean or residues um, that may exist in augers or particularly in silos or even just sweepings or old grain kept in a one ton bag. Um, if it's close enough to the storage, you'll reintroduce these pests. So just be aware that how things may enter your storage. These guys um, could be brought onto the farm in equipment or as I mentioned, will be in stuff that's already existing. Bill mentioned also the, the importance of temperature. With most of the weevils, they will stop breeding if you can maintain the temperatures below 15 degrees. But as if you can keep the temperature as low as practical, that will slow down the life cycle quite a bit. So the weevils are probably the ones that will uh, require the lower temperatures to stop breeding, but you can still slow down their development quite a bit. Um, most of these guys will be quite small, two to four millimetres long, and as with most of the weevils, you can see that uh, rice weevil sitting on a, a, a kernel there, it's not particularly big. So if your eyes are anything like mine, you're going to require um, some glasses and probably um, something to magnify those. The other one that can attack whole wheat, and these guys do have the ability to fly, and move those distances of the lesser grain borer. 
they're quite a smooth skin again they're probably two or three millimeters long and if you look at it from the top down the head is quite hard to see because it's hidden under this part of the, the thorax or the chest part sorry go back one um, these guys will lay eggs outside the grain they'll burrow in and complete a lot of the life cycle inside so again fumigations duration and dose is really important and with fumigation having that sealed silo to be able to maintain that concentration is critical um, a number of the populations around the place have demonstrated resistance to phosphine so if you've got a good gas tight silo you've identified these live insects and you've fumigated for the appropriate period of time if you're still seeing live insects in there we'd really encourage you to report those or get some testing done particularly through the programs that Phil mentioned in New South Wales we've got Joe Holloway down in, in Wagga but you could contact myself or Phil for further information about that again they'll produce the holes in the grain and these ones if you can keep that temperature below about 18 degrees um, certainly slow down the breeding but again the lower the temperature the slower the development the, the less numbers you'll have being produced over time some of the other pests that we'll see in grain storage are more these little rusty red colored fellows the confused flower beetle i mentioned the sawtooth one before and also your flat grain beetles all of these um, beetles have in various instances to show some resistance to different types of grain protectants so again when phil mentioned the importance of using two modes of action and also rotating chemistries over time is critical if you get these guys um, so just keep an eye out for each of those and again mentioning the the, the reference there there's some great pictures um, in that to help you identify a few of these guys um, a couple of other pests that are, are important to keep an eye out for. Uh, for people growing pulses in particular, you can get some of the brucids. Um, while they do have a funny shaped head, they, they don't have the same, they're not actually weevils. Um, these can infest in the field um, and they tend to go for the higher moisture contents. So keeping an eye out for these guys, particularly as you're pulling grain off, you might be looking uh, for those but they, they can get in in the field itself so monitoring that before we go in and certainly where you store things that might have higher moisture content or the ability to treat some of these as they go into storage will be quite important next one that's probably worth mentioning as well because at the end of the day most of our um, purchases that people are selling product to won't accept anything with live insects there's another little fellow called book lice or the soakers that can um, get into storages and can create some issues just as the presence of live insects these are really small um, translucent so they appear a little bit clear it mentions the bulging eyes and you can see actually on the grain here they're quite small so they'll feed on the surface and, and actively on the germ and you know typically tend to occur where you've got higher moisture and, and humidity so if you can aerate silos keep that moisture content down when it goes in and obviously um, control the temperature or keep the temperature as low as practical you go a long way to slowing down the development of all of these pests another one i just want to mention which we occasionally see in storages are members of the Oh, from the group called domestic beetles um, and commonly these are uh, referred to as carpet or skin beetles sometimes warehouse beetles and we do have a lot of native species of these guys sort of two to three millimeter as adults and have quite hairy little larvae that I'll show in a moment so we do have a number of these that are, occur in Australia and do turn up from time to time but there's one exotic species that we don't have in Australia that we want to keep an eye out as well. And it also belongs to the, the same um, group domestic A, and it's actually the same genus as um, warehouse beetle, and that's our capra beetle. Now, this is not found in Australia. Occasionally, we get interceptions of it at the border, and we like to keep an eye out to make sure that we don't have any in the country. Um, if you see any of the carry, and that's probably only going to be two or three millimeters long when it's small 
they can grow up to about six or seven millimetres in as they get into the later life stages. Um, or the adult's quite a sort of furry looking little red beetle. Anything that looks like those probably should be reported straight away. Um, they do leave casts and skin in the grain and there's a lot of countries that um, won't accept grain that has capra in it. So we, from a market access point of view, we like to demonstrate that we're free from this. So any reports we receive and we can identify as something else also helps support our surveillance to, to prove that we don't have this particular pest. Um, which brings me up to my last slide and I have gone through them pretty quickly. Um, so if you have any questions, my contact details are at the bottom. I mentioned some of those resources. But anytime you see anything unusual in, in your storage, which means that if you know how to identify those common pests that should be there, if you see anything that you can't identify, please get in contact. You can report through our exotic plot plant pest hotline in New South Wales, so that's actually a national number, um, and they will refer you on to um, how to send that information in. You can also send emails directly into our biosecurity um, at dpi.newsouthwales.gov.au, and um, we'll have a clear look at that, or some of our entomologist teams at um, the Orange Ag, Orange Ag Institute will help us identify those, and if it was anything, um, we couldn't identify from a photo, we'd get you to send samples in. Um, so a couple of numbers there, you can also get information online, but really it's about having a look at some of those resources, whether it's the GRBC um, back pocket guide for store grains or, or our grain farm by security um, booklet there. It shows you what you could expect to be in there. And if you see anything unusual, make sure you give us a call. I think that's the last one for me. And I might hand back to our facilitators to uh, see if there's any questions coming in. Thanks very much, Bill. That's um, a great presentation and really valuable in actually highlighting the importance of being able to identify your grain pests and keeping a really good monitoring program uh, and how important it really is for our grains in industry. So um, we're now heading to our question and answer panel session. So I'd really like to invite all participants today to type in or raise their hands um, if you've got questions about temporary storage and how that may relate to um, what you're thinking this season for your grain harvest handling. Um, so if you'd like to type those questions in now, we'll, um, I'll hand over to Nerali who's going to facilitate our question and answer panel this afternoon and um, and I'd also like to ask the first question of um, Philip so I'll bring Philip back online. Um, Philip my question to you is actually relating more to how to get uh, techniques or ways you might be able to suggest for producers to create that seal around some of these temporary grain storages with using tarp holands for bunkers or for the grain wings, it's so important for aeration and fumigation components of, of what you talked about. So is there any techniques that you've seen that you could advise producers on, on ways that they might be able to, in a temporary capacity, create that seal to manage that, that grain in that short term, term period while we get through harvest? Hmm. No, good question. Thanks, Wendy. Look, it it's usually makes life a lot simpler if you do the little bit of preparation prior to filling the temporary storage. You know, that bottom sheet applied to a grain bunker. Um, you know, in the case of say grain sheds, hanging curtains on those you know corrugated iron walls in a grain shed. Um, it's really that makes life a lot simpler if you actually set up prior to filling your temporary storages so you uh, can achieve a better seal. But look, for sure, commercial uh, fumigators will at times use, um, you know, special uh, uh, robust tapes to, you know, make improved seals in areas. You know, the joins on a um, tarp uh, on a bunker or the joins on any tarp uh, crucial areas that need to be properly sealed and I've seen it you know some of the bulk handlers they will spend you know on those big large um, grain bunkers they'll spend days 
just sealing the joins to ensure the gas tightness. So do the work first, I guess, Wendy. Um, if possible, do prepare early. And as I say, it's almost crucial if you intend to hold grain for a longer period in a temporary storage, do, do your homework first and it make life a lot easier for getting that proper seal for the fumigation. Great, thanks for that, Phil. Wendy, I hope you're happy for me to go on with a few of the questions that have come through over the course of today's webinar. Um, Phil, I've got another one for you. Somebody's asking, are there different considerations um, for storage based on grain type? So for example, a wheat base or um, a legume storage? Uh, okay, so in general, um, if, if they're asking around what you, you might store pulses in compared to say um, temporary bunkers, do you think that's the question, sorry? I think clear? so, yeah. Are there different ways that we need to be, is, is maybe one storage technique better for a legume versus wheat, yep. for example? Are there considerations we should have for either? Yeah, so two key ones I, I would consider is, number one, if there's any chance, like I'm very supportive of early harvest and slightly higher moistures, if particularly when storms are threatening. So if uh, be it cereals or be it pulses or oil seeds for that matter, if there's any chance the moisture content's going to be right on the top margins or a bit over, then I'd very strongly recommend you it goes into aeratable storage. To be able to drop temperatures has a huge uh, safety net, if you like, um, uh, for holding those um, slightly higher moisture content grains uh, for short periods of time, you know, four or five weeks until you can blend it or dry it, etc. Now, the second thing around, on as a general comment, uh, as I say, I have seen certainly exceptions to this, but as a general comment, I would say your cereal grains in your bunkers um, and, you know, the te more temporary storages, but things like pulses, like your chickpeas, um, and any of the other pulse grains and particularly oil seeds, I'd be feeling, a, I'd sleep a lot better at night if I had it in a comb based or a flat bottom silo with well managed aeration. And um, just there's a lot of quality aspects um, around holding grain uh, like pulses and oil seeds. It's, you don't have the options, you can't put grain protectants on them uh, with pulses and oil seeds. You know, it's a cute. Crucial thing to remember, no grain protectants on pulses and oil seeds. Therefore, you know, you really need to be careful how you store them and your options are narrow. So therefore, if you can, good aeration management really helps a lot with those particular grains. I hope that uh, answers the question. So the two points, you know, if it's going to be slightly higher moisture, have aeration. If it's going to be pulses and oil seeds, the preference again is have aeration to drop grain temperatures. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Phil. Um, Bill, I think this question's uh, for you. Somebody's asked, is there a specific time of the day for checking uh, your grain storage for pests? Uh, good question. I think the first point is checking them. Um, depends where you're taking the sample from. Um, if it's in a storage, some pests will actually tend to naturally accumulate higher up in the storage because of density and movement. So if you're using a grain probe, um, taking those, you know, can be earlier in the day or any time really. Uh, the stuff down lower, I think it's, if you're collecting a sample and sieving, it's actually getting it out and getting the insects active. So they will generally be more active um, as, as the temperature changes. So I probably haven't said that very well, but, um, any time of day is better than no, no time of day at all. Um, the top of the activity, if the silo is getting hot, you might find them going a little bit deeper. So the probe is only going to go in probably 30 or 40 centimetres. So earlier in the day would be my preference. If you've got temperature well managed, it might be a little less critical. But I'd probably defer to Phil and say, do you want to add any points to that from your, your experience as well? That, that's a very good point. I think my main point, would, like yours, would be just making sure you do do those regular checks is crucial. And um, look, the temperature probe is beautiful, isn't it? Because, the, sorry, the insect uh, 
uh, probe is big because it's in the grain the whole time um, up in the top and usually it's the top peak of the grain that we've Greg Dalglish and myself found was the ideal spot to put temperature probes so be it a grain shed or whatever um, that peak of the grain is attractive um, you've trapped the insects because it's in the grain the whole time um, it really is a case you pull it up when you feel comfortable and I'd be like you Bill I'd be going up early in the day when it's not so hot to climb the silo actually but yeah so but really just doing the job dropping a third of a bucket out of the base of a silo or getting a sample with a grain spear from a temporary storage putting it in a sieve um, sieving it hold that tray out in the sunlight as soon as you hold that white tray out in the sunlight the warmth of the sun plus the, just the sunlight itself they're trying to get away out of sunlight they're looking for sheltered sites Pests, so hold it out in the sunlight and make them move you'll see the insects better um, so yep coming back to your point Bill just just do those regular <laughs> checks that's the that's the main deal yeah great Mike, thanks uh, for that oh sorry Bill no. carry on I'll just add one bit to what Phil was encouraging earlier on as well, and that is having you know your temperature probes to monitor the changes in the silo. So if you're seeing temperatures change, you might want to increase the frequency of sampling as well, but at least once a month. But if you're seeing some temperature changes occurring, that might be a signal that the pest activity is increasing and you might want to um, monitor us a little more often in the warmer months. Yeah, great. Yep. Thank That's you like, for that, both Bill and Philip. Mm, sorry, we've got yeah, a just couple a, of really. Oh, sorry. I, I'm just going to say, particularly if for any of the mung bean growers, come uh, summertime, um, very sh uh, you know in warm conditions. Um, yeah, if, once those mung beans are a bit warm, brookets have a very quick life cycle, and uh, I, I would suggest for mung beans and brookets probably every two weeks in, in the warmer months, particularly. Okay, great. Sorry, we've got quite a few great questions coming through. So I noticed that we're just a touch over time. I hope that people can stay online just for another five minutes to cover a couple of these great questions. Um, the next one, Phil, can, there's a question asked from a grower. Can you see any issues with mixing grains, um, particularly legumes and cereals together for stock feed um, in storage? Um. It probably does open the door to a little bit more diversity of insect pests. Um, probably the more crucial question is if those grains are broken for, you know, I noticed with um, something like chickpeas, um, boy, you open the gate as soon as you have gradings of chickpeas or for whatever reason, um, whether at harvest time or the harvester operations has split um, the grain more than usual, that that is probably more of an issue. Once you start up um, having whole and mixed with broken grains, um, that then opens the door to a, a greater diversity. And it, you know, even in our laboratories, we for flour beetles and for a number of the other storage pests, we raise them on wholemeal flour and rolled oats. And that's because they breed better so uh, and, and more efficiently when things, products are processed or broken. So probably that would be more of the alarm bells. I, I think it, if it was straight whole mixed grain that was in good condition and not split, I probably don't see a great problem there. Yeah, but certainly the regular monitoring um, would be again the key and keeping an eye on temperatures as well. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, now we've had a question come in around underground storage pits, um, which we sort of expect might be quite popular around the region um, after this extensive drought and the need for some, some drought supply going forward. The question is, uh, if, if you are putting down those underground storages, is there still a need to use grain protectants and knockdowns if it'll be covered over by plastic and soil? Hmm, no, good question. Look, I think the option is definitely there um, and it would help ensure that, um, 
I, I have a general rule of thumb for Australian conditions. I say usually it is best in Australian conditions to assume all grain has some storage pests in it, probably at very low numbers that we can't detect when we sample. So if you start with that assumption, then possibly treating grain going into a grain pit is a good move because it's quite likely from the grain auger, the header, the field bin, whatever, that you just have included a few eggs of a particular storage pest. Um, so I think yes, um, but again, I always come back, please, please, before you apply those protectants, uh, is there any potential you might sell the grain out of those pits to a market down the track? Um, and if that is the case, um, it, there can be limits. But if it's just for your own stock use, yep, I can't see there being an issue applied at the correct rates of buying. And I think it's a, a useful strategy. Great, thanks for that, Phil. So the next question coming in is around aeration. Uh, and they're asking, is it effective or is it worthwhile to install in cooler climates or where cooler in the cooler grain growing regions, for example, uh, these questions come from down near Harden. Right, look, general rule of thumb is um, all storages, and I mean it, all storages in Australia, where you can fit aeration. It's one of the greatest weaknesses for storage pests. Most of the storage pests, their most rapid breeding temperatures uh, you know, where their life cycle is completed very rapidly, they're very actively feeding, um, laying eggs, etc., is around 30 to 35 degrees grain temperature. Every couple of degrees you can keep coming down away from that optimum breeding temperature is worth achieving. And all the other benefits that come with aeration, you know, venting after fumigation, aeration systems often lend in bigger storages to a little bit of simple plumbing enabling you to recirculate during a fumigation. Um, so to me, wherever you can fit aeration throughout all of Australia, and I'm, I'm including you know, Northern, uh, some of our, I know Ben White was up at Kununurra assisting people with aeration up there. So um, there is multiple reasons why you include aeration. Please get good advice around the, what fans you should use um, and, and the design. But no, my general comment was, I don't care where you're storing grain. The only exception, I guess, is if you're only holding grain for very short periods of time, you know, a few, few weeks, maybe under a month, then possibly there's a reason to say, well, I, I won't bother. But on the whole, um, you know, and another benefit, being able to hold grain that's slightly higher in moisture content uh, for short periods, again, is another benefit. So, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, please fit aeration to your storages. They're not that hard in most storages to retrofit aeration to older silos. You know, to me, 70% of pest control is good hygiene, good thorough hygiene, plus good, well-managed aeration. Those two things on their own, uh, is 70% of storage pest control. Yeah, great. Okay, I think we've just got two more questions if I can squeeze them in and then uh, we'll finish up there. The next question is, if, uh, which is quite important coming into harvest, uh, if I have to dump grain on the ground to keep harvest going, what are the tips for that last minute grain dump? Sure, I think the site, Please pick the site very carefully where you're doing it um, and um, how you're going to manage the tarp that you're going to be pulling on and off. Um, you know, I'm sure everyone's heard of stories where people are, you know, storms coming, you're in the middle of harvest, you've got to pull that tarp over. The last thing you need is one person there to try and handle a tarp when the storm winds are coming up. So, probably the two main tips would be um, pick the site carefully. You know, it's going to have good drainage away from it and how are you going to manage those tarps? So what have you worked out for the tarp management side of things? Um, yep. And uh, yeah, try and avoid obviously where you're going to get contamination on the ground. You know, try and pick soil type 
that you can level off and not have stones going to contaminate the grain as well. Yeah, that's the best three points I can come up with. So. Mm. Yeah, great. Okay, and the final question that we'll take for today. Um, is there a maximum duration of time that grain can be safely stored in grain bags um, before they start to fail from you know, environmental factors, degradation from the sun, et cetera? Sorry, could I just have you repeat that? Oh, sorry, Phil. The question was, is there a maximum time that you can keep your grain safely stored in a grain bag? Um, oh, in a grain yeah, before um, they look, start to be impacted by the environmental factors like sun and pests and that sort of thing. Sure. Look, generally a grain bag, we've actually got some good, sorry I didn't put up any graphs this time, but I just simply don't have the time to put the graphs up in a short presentation like this, but we actually have got temperatures that occur in grain bags at the surface. Grain bags really to a depth of probably um, 20, five centimetres, you will see large variations during the day and night, of course. Um, so look, if you've used a good quality bag and you pick the site carefully, you are inspecting it regularly, twice, say twice a week. Um, my general rule of thumb around grain bags is, you know, work on roughly storage period of three months. And that's really all mostly about risk. Um, Anyone who's used grain bags know you can just walk up to a grain bag and push your thumb through, even on good quality bags. So just realise you are dealing, and you know, what's the wildlife in your area like? Birds, mice, um, you know, it's more a question of where are you sighting it and how dedicated are you to patching up holes that will occur? Um, and then to try and really come straight at your answer, if if you're dedicated, you could hold uh, in you know 12 months, but you've got to be dedicated. It is a risky business in a grain bag. And that's why we say in general, when where there's free silo space, I would tend always to move grain out of a grain bag and into a silo once the silo free space was there. But three months as a general rule of thumb for most growers, but for those who are dedicated, sure, 12 months maybe a bit more. And there are growers I know who will hold for longer periods and do an excellent job, but they are keen to look after those bags. Great, thank you very much, Philip and Bill. So that's all the time we've got today for our question and answer um, session. And I thank both Philip and Bill for, for giving us those uh, direct answers about their on on farm storage, particularly in terms of the temporary storage measures. So if you'd like to get in contact with Philip or Bill about any of today's topics or discussions further about some of the questions that we just didn't quite manage to get through today, um, their contact information is on the screen now. Across the state, um, there's also a fantastic network of local land services ag advisory staff. So um, I'm sure any of your ag advisory staff within each of your individual regions across New South Wales would be happy to assist any producers in grain storage inquiries and also to help you connect with any of the resources and um, also to Philip and Bill if you have any inquiries about pest identification and um, and how to how to get samples to to um, to Bill as well. Feel free to use those um, those ag advisory services throughout the region. We have got a number of growers who have also joined us today throughout Queensland as well. So we're, we're coming uh, to you live across two states. So it's great to have everybody's interaction. For up to date information about other local land services events that are specific to your region um, for ag services, please go to your local land services uh, website and go to the events page and I'm sure you can see um, any upcoming events that are happening within your local region. I'd also um, like to let producers know that we hope for participants to join us on this coming Friday for the webinar part two of this series and um, you can register at the link that's also shown on your screen. 
So that brings us to the end of today's today's first webinar in this two-part series. We hope that you've found the webinar really useful. So as I said, Friday's webinar, we will be talking about more permanent storage structures and they will be focusing around both silos, uh, coned and flat bottom, as well as grain storage um, sheds and, and the processes and practices that need to be happen with those storage types to help make your your storage successful in those. We'll also be discussing areas around how to control um, some biosecurity with some of your grains with Bill as well. So we look forward to that um, discussion and, and don't forget to register for that individual event as well. Thank you all for taking the time to participate in today's event. We've had some great questions come through and, and, um, and we're really hoping that that information has, has started pointing you in some really good direction to make some decisions around your temporary storage options for your individual enterprises. Uh, I'd ask that all participants at the end of this webinar complete a quick five uh, question survey, which will launch straight away. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries Plant Biosecurity Unit, Agri-Science Department of Agriculture and Fisheries Queensland, who have worked with local land services to make this series possible. I'd like to thank Bill and Philip for today's presentations and their, their discussions today, and also narrowly in co-facilitating um, with me as well. So I look forward to hosting you on Friday for our second series webinar, and I wish you a happy day and thank you very much.